Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Janelle Potter? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Janelle Potter was born in 1982 and was raised in an area about 40 minutes west of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She moved to the town of Mountain City, Tennessee in 2004 with her parents, Marvin and Barbara Potter. The town had about 2,500 residents. Marvin was a former Marine and claimed to have worked for the CIA at one point. Barbara had worked at Hewlett Packard. Marvin and Janelle both collected disability payments, Marvin because he injured his back, and Janelle for a number of health issues, including anxiety, diabetes, hearing problems, and being developmentally delayed. Janelle did not socialize much. Her parents didn't allow her to have boyfriends, stay out late at night, or drive a car. She was described as socially awkward, naive, innocent, sweet, deceptive, and immature. Innocent and deceptive don't really seem congruent, but incongruity seems to be a theme in this case. In 2009, Janelle met a pharmacy clerk named Tracy Greenwell. They became friends. It appears as though Tracy kind of felt sorry for Janelle. Janelle started dating Tracy Greenwell's cousin, Jamie Kurd. She did not tell her parents about the relationship. Jamie bought Janelle a prepaid cell phone so they could maintain secret communication. Barbara found the phone, so Jamie bought a second one. One could argue that the quality of a relationship can be measured by how many secret prepaid cell phones have to be purchased. As she was dating Jamie, Janelle had a crush on another man named Billy Payne. He was Tracy's brother. Billy Payne struggled with opioid use, but was trying to get his life back on track. In 2010, Billy started dating a woman named Billie Jean Hayworth. So Billy Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth, they both have the first name Billy, although it's spelled differently. Janelle wasn't too happy about the situation. Even though Janelle was socially awkward, she maintained an active presence on social media. Janelle claimed that she was targeted by an anonymous bully on Facebook. She was called a bad person and horrible. She was getting threatened with physical violence. She told people that the mysterious offender was Billie Jean Hayworth. She said that Billie Jean hated her because she was pretty. Some people have suggested that this may not have been Janelle's best argument. As this was going on, someone was posting unpleasant comments about Payne and Hayworth on Facebook and another website. There was a lot of animosity between the parties. Janelle was saying terrible things about Hayworth including wishing that her child would die. Janelle contacted the police a few times. On one occasion, she said someone had thrown a rock at the house where she lived. The full names of Payne and Hayworth were clearly written on the stone with a black marker. Conveniently, there were no witnesses to this alleged offense. On January 31, 2012, at about 10 a.m., a neighbor of Billy Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth found the couple dead in their home. Their seven-month-old son was found in a bedroom covered with Billie Jean's blood. He was not otherwise injured. Payne and Hayworth had been shot. Payne's throat was also slashed. The police started investigating. They interviewed the Potter family, but really didn't make any progress. After this, they interviewed Jamie Kurd. The police gave him a so-called lie detector test and told him that he failed, even though somebody can't fail or pass a polygraph, as they are nonsense. The police used it as a tool to attempt to trick Jamie into confessing, but he didn't confess even after hours of being interviewed. Then Jamie asked the police, is the CIA here? The police weren't sure what to make of this question. As it turns out, Jamie and Janelle's mother, Barbara, had been emailing and texting with someone who they believed worked for the CIA. His name was Chris. He becomes important later in this narrative. At this point, Jamie told the police that Marvin was the killer. The police had Jamie call Marvin and try to get a confession. Marvin made inculpatory statements on the recording 
that didn't rise to the level of a confession, but they were enough for the police to arrest him and bring him in for questioning. The police really didn't get anywhere when interviewing Marvin, so they had Marvin call his wife Barbara. He told her, I did it. He didn't say what he did, but this was enough for the police to arrest Marvin. They also arrested Jamie. The police searched the Potter family house. They found photographs of the victims, the family computer that had a lot of interesting information on it, and in the bed of Marvin's Ford F-250, they found three bags of shredded documents, which appeared to contain email messages. By reconstructing these shredded documents and examining the computer, the police found out more about this guy, Chris. In a series of emails to Jamie and Barbara, Chris claimed that he was a CIA operative who was given the task of protecting Janelle at all costs. He was maintaining surveillance on all the players in the situation. He talked about how Janelle was being bullied by Billy Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth. By tracking the IP address of these emails, the police noticed that it matched the IP address of the computer in the Potter residence. They believed that Janelle was posing as Chris. It was clear from the information available that Janelle, Barbara, Marvin, and Jamie were conspirators, not just Marvin and Jamie. The police arrested Barbara and Janelle. Jamie Kurd entered into a plea deal. He received 25 years in prison in exchange for his testimony against the Potter family. Marvin, Barbara, and Janelle were all convicted of murder and given two life sentences. Marvin is eligible for parole in 2132 at age 182. Barbara and Janelle could be released as early as 2072. Barbara would be 120 years old and Janelle 89. Barbara once sent herself a link to some article titled, Can God Forgive a Murder? This sounds like a heavy philosophical question. It's fitting that Barbara will have plenty of time to figure out the answer. Now moving to my analysis. This case is unusual for a number of reasons. Everybody in this case except for Janelle did not have the full picture of what was going on. She was actually the mastermind. The victims did not know their lives were in danger. Marvin only learned information from Barbara. He didn't participate in any of the electronic communication. He was computer illiterate. Jamie was in communication with Chris to some extent. Barbara communicated with Chris quite a bit. And of course, everyone communicated with Janelle. Janelle was really playing two parts in this play, herself and the fictitious character, Chris. Janelle was able to manipulate her mother into manipulating her father into committing a double homicide. It sounds as if Marvin kind of took Jamie along to commit the crime. Marvin was highly motivated to kill, Jamie not quite as much, which is reflected in his prison sentence. Building a case against Barbara and Janelle was not easy. There were a substantial number of emails written from this fictitious Chris character. The prosecution had to sift through all of them and try to figure out the answers to two questions. Did anything in the emails represent solicitation for murder? And were the emails from Chris similar enough to other content generated by Janelle to prove that Janelle was in fact Chris? As far as the solicitation for murder piece, none of the emails contained anything explicit, but they certainly danced around the subject a lot. The prosecution was able to make their case just based on the sheer quantity of references to killing, death, revenge, harassment, and hatred. One area in particular that stood out was how Barbara was saying that Marvin was really good at killing people. As far as proving that Janelle wrote the emails, the IP address connection wasn't enough to prove Janelle was Chris. The prosecution wanted at least a little bit more. As it turns out, Janelle demonstrated a pattern of certain grammatical mistakes in her writing that matched those of Chris. She left a letter or two out of many words, she capitalized words that didn't need to be capitalized. She used run-on sentences like they were going out of style. She transposed letters. She took single words and wrote them as two words. Like instead of outside, she would write outside. She did not seem to like double consonants when adding ing, like in the word sitting. And she would leave the e in a root word before adding ing, like with the word leave. Her grammar mistakes contributed greatly to her being convicted. Just one more reason to build good grammar skills 
more good grammar can equal less prison. It's one of those benefits that doesn't get mentioned a lot. Now let's take a look at this fictitious character, Chris, created by Janelle. Apparently a man named Chris Chayden was the inspiration for the Chris character. Janelle had known Chris Chayden from school back in Pennsylvania. They had not spoken since Janelle graduated from high school in 2000, but it was clear that she had a crush on him. Here are a few things we learned about Chris in the email messages. He was a CIA agent who traveled around the world killing people. He loved his job. If he killed people with the same brutality as he killed Grammar, he was truly a heinous offender. Chris was an avenger of Janelle's enemies. He would kill people who messed with her. He had an affinity for her, protected her, valued her. Unlike Janelle, Chris would use expletives, call people names, and speak in a hateful manner. So Janelle was able to separate that part of herself into this other character. She didn't do those things with her mother, with Jamie, or with her father. Chris did all of that. When Barbara requested a CIA ID badge for Marvin, because he wanted one, Chris said that his supervisors had one for Marvin, it just hadn't been delivered yet. So Janelle, posing as Chris, was stringing Barbara along so that Marvin could be satisfied. Here's what may have happened with the construction of the Chris character. This is just a theory, my opinion. Janelle made Chris into a friend who she wished that she really had. She was lonely and awkward, didn't really have any friends. She appeared to have vulnerable narcissism. She was insecure, ashamed, resentful, and vindictive. She wanted a champion on her side who would do her bidding, someone who would judge her enemies as harshly or even more harshly than she did. He was a fictional representation of her rage and neediness, a virtual expression of her pain. In a sense, the creation of Chris was compensatory. By writing all those emails as Chris, he became real in a way. Janelle was able to lose herself in the fantasy. She didn't need to feel bad because Chris was her powerful ally. In addition, the behavior of the character was having real-life consequences. Janelle was successfully manipulating people around her. Chris was allowing Janelle to take form as a destructive force. Janelle's hatred coming alive through Chris would cause death. The next item I'll look at here is the manipulation in this case. Janelle successfully manipulated people to carry out her will. It was not because she was sophisticated. Janelle was actually painfully transparent, clumsy, and obvious in her efforts. How did she fool Barbara, and how did Barbara fool Marvin? I think that Janelle was able to tap into the ideal image that Barbara had of her. Janelle was innocent. She was the victim of all these terrible people. She was cowering in fear as these bullies victimized her. Barbara wanted to protect her, and she did not realize that Chris was fake. She thought that this CIA agent really knew Janelle and wanted to protect her. Janelle was able to fool her mother by posing as an authority figure. In addition, Barbara was unbelievably gullible. As far as Barbara manipulating Marvin, Marvin seemed to be obsessed with his stories about the CIA. In addition to asking Barbara to ask Chris for a CIA ID badge, Marvin approached the local sheriff in 2007 and talked about how he had worked for the CIA and was expecting to be reactivated at any time. So I guess he was kind of offering to help out with local crime because he was this big-time CIA agent. Marvin seemed obsessed with the idea that he could gain permission to kill. He had dozens of firearms and knives spread all over his house. It was not like a collection that he kept locked away or in some orderly fashion. These items were just scattered everywhere. He often carried a gun in plain sight. He wasn't concealing it. He wanted people to know that he had it. Marvin seemed like a person who gained a sense of purpose by being intimidating, violent, and powerful. The reference to the CIA clearly influenced him greatly, which may have been why Janelle selected that occupation for Chris in the first place. By killing two innocent victims, Marvin was able to tap into his paranoia, desire for power, and his excitement-seeking tendency. Janelle Potter's defense at her trial was that she was not smart enough to orchestrate this crime. She was like a child. 
In the end, I think Janelle was much more capable than people give her credit for, although one has to consider the capabilities of the people she manipulated as well. So this was a very low-level game. Nobody here was sophisticated, really, at any level. I find it interesting that everybody underestimated how dangerous Janelle was. Even though they knew that she could be deceptive, and it was fairly clear that she was not being harassed and was actually harassing other people. Janelle's parents sheltered her. They prevented her from having normal experiences with her peers, and they believed every word that she said. Inside of Janelle, feelings of rage, vindictiveness, and sadism were expanding. She was limited in the physical world, like her parents prevented her from going places. Therefore, she turned to the online world and used what little skill she had to manipulate her parents by targeting their fear, anxiety, anger, and desire. These were all feelings that Janelle understood. She perfectly struck them in all their areas of weakness and crafted the demise of two innocent people. Those are my thoughts on the case of Janelle Potter. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be as interesting as a fake CIA agent with bad grammar. Thanks for watching.